1938, German General Werner Freiherr von Fritsch expressed his opinion that the military organisation with the best aerial reconnaissance would win the next war. Aerial reconnaissance, or the art of taking photographs of enemy territory from above, had been used in the First World War to create maps on both sides of the conflict. As camera equipment and photographic techniques continued to develop, so too did the process of deriving information from photographs, a process which came to be known as photographic intelligence. I'm here at Danesfield House in Buckinghamshire. Nowadays, this place is a hotel, but during the Second World War, the building was requisitioned by the Royal Air Force, which set up a unit here known as RAF Medmanum. This was the centre of Joint Service Imagery Intelligence, and many members of the WAF worked here in different capacities to try to glean usable intelligence from millions of aerial reconnaissance photos. During the Second World War, photographic intelligence provided a vast wealth of accurate information on the enemy's intentions and capabilities at significant speed. Allied pilots flew over enemy territory, taking photos that were brought back to Britain where they would be interpreted. At Medmenham, members of the British, American and Canadian Armed Forces worked to make sense of these images. One of the most useful forms of intelligence you can have during a time of war is actual photographs of what the enemy is up to. Here at Medmenham, thousands, millions of photos were taken over the course of the war and developed to reveal what the Axis powers were doing, what concentration of forces there were, where they were, what kind of technical development was happening. All kinds of information could be drawn from these photos. Many of the personnel involved in the lengthy process of going from aerial reconnaissance camera to usable intelligence were members of the WAF. The WAF working at Medmenham were among the first Allied personnel to know the details of impending operations in raids, including Operation Chastise, the Dambusters raid, and the D-Day landings. One of the things they were looking for on aerial photos was in fact evidence of enemy defences for the D-Day landings. Other things that they were looking for might include troop movements, the technological development, and they even took special requests from the Special Operations Executive and SIS or MI6, who might, for example, ask them to look for suitable areas where they could carry out parachute drops. So what did it take to be a photographic interpreter? What were the skills needed? It's clear to see from these aerial photographs that this work was not easy. A photo taken from thousands of feet in the air doesn't look like a regular picture and it took specialist training to be able to read these images. The value of photographic intelligence was realised in 1939, and the Directorate of Intelligence created a special section to prepare intelligence officers for this work. Despite this, however, in September 1939, there were only eight capable officers available. A chronic shortage of men due to the demands of war led to the recruitment of women and by mid-1940, WAF officers were serving in photographic intelligence roles. Wing Commander Sidney Cotton, one of the fathers of modern photographic intelligence, believed that women naturally possessed the necessary attributes for PI work, his reasoning being that looking through magnifying glasses at minute objects in a photograph required the patience of Job and the skill of a good darner of socks. WAF working in photographic intelligence came from diverse backgrounds. There were archaeologists and professors from Oxbridge who exceeded the maximum age for women's conscription, and others who had barely turned 18. These women were required to possess a good visual memory, the ability to sketch, attention to detail, a mind that naturally asks questions and an appreciation of the significance of objects and students were required to become curious in the unusual. 
WAF were given responsibility for decision making in every aspect of gathering, analysing and disseminating intelligence at RAF Medmenham. Do you think it would be easy to make sense of an aerial photograph? To be able to look at a photo that had been taken looking straight down on something and be able to make out what was on it. But actually, it was pretty difficult because pictures taken from that angle showed things from a, a different perspective than people were used to looking at in photos. And looking straight down, a silo might appear as a circle. So actually, it was quite difficult. And one of the WAF who was based here at Medmenham said that reading these photos was almost a secret language. There were several stages in the process of photographic interpretation. Firstly, the reconnaissance aircraft would carry out a sortie, or a flight, over occupied territory, taking aerial photos with cameras mounted in strategic locations on the plane. When it landed, the crew would be quizzed by WAF operators so that they could provide context and ensure accuracy of location when the photographs went to be interpreted. Sometimes it was possible to issue initial intelligence reports from the basic combination of the camera negatives and reports from the pilots. Often it was WAF who actually developed the photos. The location's photograph would be plotted on a map by a WAF plotter and the images were filed by date. Within two hours of the aircraft landing, first phase intelligence reports were issued from the prints. The pictures were then sent to specialist interpreters, many of whom were at Medmenham. Once there, they would be plotted again by the WAF, and within 24 hours of the aircraft landing, a more detailed intelligence report had been issued. At Medmenham, photographic interpreters specialising in specific things, aircraft for instance, or airfields, would carry out detailed analysis using detailed knowledge and experience of their particular area. This work was extremely secret and accuracy was paramount. The WAF working here at Medmenham did so under conditions of extreme secrecy. They couldn't talk with anyone outside of here about their work. And they were often asked to use skills that they didn't have to a very high level from school. Because in the 1940s, it wasn't common for girls to take maths and physics and the sciences to a very high level. So they were having to exercise skills that were new to them in a way. And they rose to the challenge and wrote manuals for those coming up behind them to use in the learning process. There were some worries that having to be up close to the horrors of war in these photographs might upset the WAF and that they might become emotional. But for the most part, exactly the opposite is true. And seeing the horrors of war up close made them work harder because they knew what was at stake. Despite the challenges they faced, the WAF proved to be extremely adept at photographic intelligence work and their contributions were significant in some of the most well-known of the RAF's Second World War operations. Intelligence gleaned from photos of the Ruhr Valley dams, for instance, was used in the planning for Operation Chastise, the daring raid by the dam busters of 617 Squadron. Detailed models were constructed from the photographs, which the air crews studied extensively to familiarise themselves with the territory over which they would be flying. Models were also constructed for the combined operations raid on the port of Saint-Nazaire in 1942, for Operation Torch, the North African landings, and for the Allied invasion of Normandy, or D-Day. WAF photographic intelligence officers provided critically important information from the photographs they studied for D-Day, including details of possible airfields and beaches where Allied aircraft, paratroopers and vessels could land and information on enemy anti-invasion defences, like spiked hedgehogs. These women provided critically important information that contributed to major operational decision-making at the highest levels and to the success of various Allied operations. In a time of war, there's often a rush to develop new technology, especially new weapons that you can use against 
the enemy. And that was certainly true of both sides during the Second World War. And that made life really difficult for the photo interpreters at Medmenham who were responsible for looking at enemy weapons. Because sometimes they'd be looking for things they'd never seen before and didn't have that much information on what they looked like. That was certainly true of the famous German V weapons, like this one behind me, which is a replica of a V1. In early 1943, reports of secret German weapons trials reached London, causing great concern. Photographic interpreters at Medmenham were instructed to look for anything that might be linked to these trials, and all intelligence pointed to a threat involving a long-range projector or a firing ramp. WAF Constance Babington-Smith, head of the aircraft section at Medmenham, worked to identify anything that might pertain to the secret weapons, instructed to look for a very small aircraft which might be pilotless. She spotted what she called an absurd little object on some of the photographs she had been given to study. The tiny cruciform object appeared to be on some sort of catapult structure, which she could see was ramped upwards because of the shadow on the pictures where the structure had been banked up with earth. She alerted the industry section to her findings, but was told that what she had spotted was most likely dredging equipment connected to the water nearby. Constance wasn't convinced, and she and her team continued their investigation. They soon concluded that the unidentified weapon on the banked up ramp was in fact a V-1 flying bomb. The V-1 was an 850 kilogram warhead, a pilotless aircraft that could travel at 400 miles per hour after being launched from a specially designed ramp. In December 1943, Constance became the first Allied person to confirm that the V-1 was the dreaded secret weapon Hitler had intended to launch against Britain. A total of 96 V-1 sites were detected and thanks to Constance and her WAF colleagues, all of them were eventually destroyed by Allied bombs. Constance finding the V1 has a bit of a personal significance for me because my grandmother was a schoolchild in London during the Second World War and she fell and cut her knee in the playground while running from a V1. The work carried out by the WAF and photographic intelligence was crucially important to Allied operations throughout the Second World War. In the fight against the V-1s, and in the preparations for D-Day in particular, photographic intelligence proved to be one of the most important and reliable sources of information. The WAF at Medmenham were recognised as having done extremely valuable work, displaying devotion to duty initiative and imaginative thinking on a daily basis. As stated by Marshal of the Royal Air Force, Lord Arthur Tedder, the contribution of photographic intelligence to the ultimate success of the Allied cause, and the part of the WAF within it, was quite incalculable.